Hey everybody, real fast before the kill count, we just want to remind you all that our new YouTube figures are still available for pre-sale for one more week. Yes, they're on pre-sale until November 3rd at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. So go to YouTube's.com to get your cute little James and Chelsea ghost face. Yeah, do it while you can. And in the meantime, enjoy this Danganronpa kill count courtesy of Chelsea. <laughs> Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror media. I'm Ultimate Host Chelsea Rebecca, and today we're looking at... <laughs> Specifically, Trigger Happy Havoc, released in 2010. Trigger Happy Havoc is the first entry in a trilogy of mainline games developed by Spike Chunsoft, which was still just Spike when they published the first game. Alongside these three main games, there's two spin-offs, anime, manga, novels, mobile games, and even stage plays. This series is absolutely massive, but its success came after a difficult conceptual period. Originally, creator and writer Kazutaka Karaka had a much more gruesome game in mind. Entitled Distrust, this initial version of Danganronpa was dark and dingy, with a grimy warehouse setting instead of a high school. Spike was worried this kind of explicit horror game wouldn't sell in Japan. Karaka explains, It may be different in America, but the market for horror is extremely narrow in Japan. When we started working on the game, we figured it might be too horrific, too gruesome, and it would really limit our audience. In order to make it appealing to more people, we decided to add what I call pop elements. To make it a little more palatable for more people, that's why we moved away from the first version of Danganronpa. And so we get the vivid, candy-colored game that's so beloved today. Danganronpa follows the elite students of Hope's Peak Academy, who are captured and forced into a Battle Royale-style murder game. Check out our podcast on Battle Royale, by the way. Kodoka would agree that the film is mandatory viewing. <laughs> The addition of Clash Trials turns this neon pink death game into a series of mysteries the player must solve. Part of Danganronpa's charm is its vast mix of influences. It's a big bombastic mashup of tropes and styles, combining elements from classic whodunits, slice of life animes, and cinematic inspirations like Saw and Cube. It's a melting pot of games as well. While Danganronpa is a visual novel, it also includes elements of shooters, dating games, rhythm games, and even Hangman. I know she stabbed him with a knife. But can you spare? the word nice! There's so much, in fact, not all of it can make it into the kill count. Which, this channel says a lot, but I mean it this time. This was almost 25 hours of gameplay. We'll be leaving out countless clues, puzzles, backstories, each performance of Monokuma Theater, and every single pervy side quest. Wanna know what's behind this blur? Too bad! Wallow in your despair and play the game! Will this homeroom from hell drum up some- Up. Oh. hi James. Oh, shit, I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention to where I was going. <laughs> it, that's fine. Uh, yeah, if you could just, you know. Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry. Okay. I'm going. Sorry. Wait! You're wearing my fragrance from today's sponsor, Scentbird. Objection! Th nope, that's not the right game. Whatever. I can't believe you stole my Scentbird. You don't understand. I had to. This crazy panda said that if I didn't successfully steal a bottle, he'd imprison me on the kill count set. Okay, fine. I just wanted to try it. I mean, you kept talking about how much you love this nectar to peach with its notes of peach nectar and, and honeysuckle and coconut water. That's true. I love how it reminds me of those 2000s perfumes that pop stars would sell, you know? Not really. But you'll have to get your own. And with your Scentbird subscription, that'll be easy. Since you get a new 30-day supply of your choosing every month. Meaning you can get the scents you know you want to try and avoid ones you know aren't your style. Like how I avoid heavier scents. Yeah, but I already have so many fragrances in my queue. Well, you can always grab extras on top of your monthly bottle. That's what I did so I can switch between the nectar and this Malayan tiger scent. Which has notes of mandarin and jasmine. As well as this Sous Le Pont Mirbeau. Which has sandalwood, pink pepper, and and cedar wood whenever I feel like it. I guess I can just wait for my next shipment. That sounds great, honey. Now get off my set. Please. US and Canada viewers can grab their own bottle using coupon code MEAT55 for 55% off at Scentbird. At just over $7 for your first month, you are practically stealing it. But not actually, to be clear. Will this homeroom from hell drum up some killer class participation? Let's find out and get to the kills. 
game begins with a two-faced teddy bear taunting his tied-up prey. He sends his captive rocketing up to the moon only for them to totally get boned by a crash landing. Well, that kind of killer cutscene is enough to earn you a title screen! We get a big anime intro to our very large cast of characters. This is the student body of Hope's Peak Academy, an elite high school in bustling any town Japan. These kids are more than just well-rounded students. They're ultimates. Prodigies who have become the very best at what they do, and all before they're even old enough to play the game they're starring in. This year's class includes students like Sayaka Maizono, the ultimate pop sensation, and Liam Kawada, the ultimate baseball star. There is, however, an exception to this rule. Meet Makoto Naegi, protagonist, point of view character, and thoroughly average dude. Unlike his classmates, he was chosen at random through a national lottery, and accepted into Hope's Peak as the ultimate lucky student. Naturally, he's feeling a little overwhelmed, but with the promise of success and fortune after graduation, Makoto steps inside. He's about two steps into the building before he shows off his true ultimate ability, just kind of blacking out in the middle of a scene. He has the constitution of a consumptive Victorian child. Get used to this. Makoto comes to in an empty classroom with an ominous note. He makes his way over to the main hall where the rest of the students have already assembled. Everyone else seems to be just as confused as he is, having also similarly passed out. As the last one to arrive, Makoto introduces himself to the class, and there's a lot of them, so hang tight. Meet our 15 students. Class pet Taka is the ultimate narc for his dedication to school rules and regulations, while Toko Fukawa is the ultimate writing prodigy who's about as insecure as most writers are. <laughs> what the heck? There's also ultimate programmer Chihiro, ultimate swimmer Hina, ultimate muscle mommy Sakura, and ultimate fashionista Junko, whose killer look I couldn't resist modeling today. Makoto learns based baseball star Leon's turned his back on the sport to pursue a career in music, while the mysterious Kyoko refuses to disclose her ultimate talent at all. Roll Call continues with some less traditional students, like Ultimate Essential Oils user Hiro, Ultimate Girl Boss Celeste, Ultimate Waifu Pillow Collector Hifumi, and Mondo, the Ultimate Biker Gang Leader, just the high school leader of Japan's biggest biker gang. Rounding out the group is Ultimate Nepo Baby Byakuya, heir to the powerful Togami family, and again pop star Sayaka who Makoto has a serious crush on. Pleasant scent. Careful, Makoto, we don't need you passing out again. Surprisingly, Sayaka seems to recognize Makoto, but their class reunion will have to wait till later. Some bells portend a morning announcement, courtesy of a mysterious TV voice. The students are summoned to the gym, where they're greeted by the teddy bear we saw in the intro. I'm not a teddy bear. Oh shit, sorry, not a teddy bear. This is Monokuma, a malevolent mechanical maniac and self-proclaimed headmaster of Hope's Peak. Their plushy principal reveals they've all been barred inside the school, and can expect to live the rest of their lives here as a commune. Naturally, the thought of staying in high school forever freaks some people out, so Monokuma reveals a graduation clause. You can go back home, provided you first murder one of your classmates. I never went to private school, but I imagine that this is basically what it is. Some slightly horrifying trivia, Monokuma wasn't always a bear. Early on in development, Monokuma was a naked guy on one side and organs and bones on the other. Kind of like one of those science classroom inner anatomy statuettes. This turn of events doesn't exactly sit well with the students, but when one of them tries to take matters into his own hands, Monokuma shows he means business with a self-destructive explosion. Turns out, Monokuma has multiple robot bodies throughout the school, as well as surveillance cameras to monitor the students' behavior. Destroying any of them is punishable by death. But Monokuma decides to let the kids off with a warning, distributing some student handbooks before leaving them to their thoughts. Tensions are running high, and apparently unsatisfied with almost having his arm exploded, Alpha Cyclist Mondo picks a fight with the equally abrasive one percenter Byakuya. Makoto tries to break it up, but winds up breaking his face in the process and passing out again. He regains consciousness for the second time inside of a dorm room. I know the situation is rough, but hey, at least it looks like they all have private bathrooms. Makoto Romcom collides with Sayaka outside, who brings him to a class meeting in the dining hall. The other students share what they've discovered while well, he's been Makomatos. Everyone's assigned a personal dorm room, each with their own key and nameplate. Conveniently, the rooms are also completely soundproofed, which seems like a risky choice for a school of horny anime teens, but hey, I'm not the ultimate architect. The building appears to have upper floors, but the stairs have been barred shut, along with all the windows outside. Despite 
Despite the renovations, a map the enigmatic Kyoko found implies that this is indeed Hope's Peak Academy, much to everyone's shock. To prevent the threat of bedtime bloodshed, Card Shark Celeste proposes a curfew, which everyone agrees to. Makoto spends the next couple of days getting to know his classmates, which mostly entails thirsting after Sayaka. She doesn't mind, though. Sayaka was actually a middle school classmate of Makoto's, and she reveals she actually had a childhood crush on him. All this Wattpad romance is no fun for Monokuma, who decides to incentivize the students with some murderous motivations. He shows the students some videos from home, but this isn't a sweet survivor reunion. The loved ones in these videos seem to be in danger, sending the students into a panic about what's happening on the outside. Jeff Probst would never. The black and white bear blackmail does its job since that night Sayaka shows up at Makoto's door saying someone just tried to force their way into her room. In order to ease her mind, Makoto offers to switch rooms with her, which would be a nicer gesture if he didn't use the opportunity to sniff her pillow. However, Sayaka doesn't show up at breakfast the next morning. When Makoto runs to check on her, he finds the popped star splattered in blood pinker than Saw 3Ds. Makoto passes out for the umpteenth time, someone please get this boy some compression socks, and he wakes up in the gymnasium. Monokuma arrives to address the student body, or at least what's left of her. While the graduation clause says a murder means freedom, it does come with a little fine print. Not only do you have to kill another student, but you have to get away with it as well. Before a successful graduate is crowned, the students will have the chance to pinpoint the murderer in an upcoming class trial. If they identify the guilty party, the blackened, the culprit will be executed accordingly. But should they fail to corner the killer, the blackened will graduate from school, and everyone else will fail with a final fatal F. This all proves too much for the fashion-forward Junko, who stomps on Monokuma with some stylish combat boots. Monokuma decides they totally clash with her look, though, and responds by turning this cover girl into a very chic pincushion. I'll feed her saying Junko. No time to process that lifelong trauma, however, since there's only so much time to study up for the class trial. Since Sayaka was killed in Makoto's room, he's quickly pinned as the prime suspect, meaning he'll have to work double time to clear his name. He starts at his bed room where he notices several strange clues. The nameplate on the door has been swapped with Sayaka's, who also left behind a message in blood. The number's 11037. If you think you know who did it based on this one clue alone, congratulations! You absolutely do. This clue is much less obvious if your native language isn't English or if you've never been bored with a calculator before. Additionally, a kitchen knife is missing from the cafeteria. At the class trial, Makoto has to tell Phoenix right from wrong in a techno-rave shooting gallery style debate. It's all very overstimulating. The million dollar question is how Sayaka's murderer got into the room, since Makoto should have the only key. The answer comes from Kyoko, who sleuthed out a note written by Sayaka asking someone to meet her. That, along with the swap nameplates, leads Kyoko to believe Sayaka invited her killer over herself. She wanted someone to come to the room she was in and also hide the fact that it was Makoto's room. This discussion sparks both of Hina's brain cells to life, leading her to recall that it was Sayaka, not Makoto, who was in the kitchen when the knife went missing. Makoto arrives at the terrible truth that Sayaka had been trying to frame him for murder, and that she was ultimately killed in self-defense. But who was her unlucky victim? That answer comes from Sayaka's dying message, which Makoto realizes was written upside down. Rather than a series of numbers, it's actually a name, that of ultimate goatee guy Lee. On. Our home plate homicider attempts to deny the accusation, but after a quick round of dance dance incrimination, he's ultimately voted as the murderer. As punishment for his crimes, Leon is pelted by practice balls until he's an angel in the outfield. Major bummer for Makoto, who goes back to his room to find all traces of his spring fling flushed away. Maybe he can distract himself by exploring the parts of the school Monokuma's unlocked. New areas include a pool, which gets ultimate swimmer Hina very excited, and a library which is more Byakuya's speed because he has glasses. I'm trying to read, so if you could be quiet. There, the students find a letter that implies Hope's Peak closed down a year ago, as well as a broken laptop, both covered in dust. With the killing game seemingly at a ceasefire, the cast continue to build bonds with each other in ways that definitely won't come back to haunt them. Mondo takes computer whiz Chihiro under his arm and challenges hall monitor Taka to a dick measuring contest in the sauna. You can take off your uniform, you know? Go ahead. 
I won't judge. Letting off the steam is helpful since the two emerge as best bro friends. Monokuma is both antisocial and anti brochial which means it's time for a new murderous motive. This time it's a stack of secret secrets, which Monokuma threatens to publish unless another body hits the floor. Very, there's someone inside your house of him. Makoto's secret is less bloodshedy and more bedwetty, hardly worth killing over, but several students have more bastardy skeletons in their closets. Among them is Chihiro, who fails to show up to their morning meeting. The rest of the class eventually finds the programmer unplugged in the girls' locker room. Her blood has been used to leave a sloppy signature, which Byakuya identifies as the calling card of prolific serial killer Genocide Jack. Jack was thrown out earlier as the possible mastermind behind their abduction. However, Monokuma assures them Chihiro was killed by a classmate, which doesn't exactly rule out the legendary serial killer as the culprit. It just means that Genocide Jack might actually be one of them. Makoto quickly jumps into his investigation. He identifies the murder weapon, a nearby dumbbell, and observes the blood stain on a, uh, a big boobed supermodel. Stay focused, Makoto. Novelist Toko pulls a real Makoto and promptly passes out at the sight of all that blood. She wakes up tongue tied and runs off. Hina and Makoto try to check on her, but can't parse out her ranting and raving. <laughs> Won't let Genocide Jack have control! Unexpectedly, business boy Byakuya decides to help Makoto out by showing him a secret room in the library. This thing is a treasure trove of national secrets, including a police file on Genocide Jack that theorizes he has a split personality. At the class trial, Byakuya reveals the identity of their serial killer classmate, its ultimate writing prodigy Toko, whose strange behavior has been a result of her hidden Mr. Hyde. Toko works herself into a dead faint, allowing her split personality to take the light. I'm the ultimate murderous fiend, Genocide Jack! Or better yet, let's go with Genocide Jill! However, upon reflecting on the police file, Makoto determines Genocide Jill wouldn't have killed Chihiro, since her past victims were all male. The people I kill with such passion and conviction are all adorable little men! Furthermore, the ultimate misandrous murder weapon of choice are her special scissors, not something inelegant like a dumbbell. Makoto accuses Byakuya of framing Toko, since he had access to the crime scene photos as well as the cord that was used to suspend Shihiro's body. Bizarrely, messy ass Byakuya admits to staging the crime scene, but not to killing Chihiro. Adding to the confusion, Kyoko takes everyone out for a short recess, during which she reveals the thing that's gonna make this kill count come to a screeching halt. Be sure to check her and Entire body. When I first decided I wanted to do Danganronpa, this twist was the thing I was least looking forward to covering. Even if you've never played the game, you can probably guess where this is going. It's revealed in this sequence that Chihiro has a penis. I'll just be blunt about it. This storyline and the character of Chihiro in general have been analyzed and written about by people much smarter than me, and the kill count is just not a great format to explore the implications of this reveal. After this scene, the characters refer to Chihiro as a boy, fans refer to Chihiro as both a boy and a girl, and there's a lot of healthy and not so healthy debate about it. I'm gonna keep it all off the binary and refer to Chihiro as they from now on. I think the one thing we can all agree on though, is that Chihiro is baby. With everything out in the open, Makoto finally makes sense of this messy murder. Chihiro had been exercising at night to hide their true identity from the group. They were actually murdered in the boys' locker room before being moved, which is how that bloody boob poster ended up in the girls' room. The crime scene was then further altered by chaotic neutral Byakuya, who witnessed the whole thing go down. As the trial progresses, it becomes clear that whoever murdered Chihiro hid their gender by destroying their handbook with the sauna steam. The only person who would have known how to do that is Mondo who broke his own handbook while wearing his clothes during the sauna showdown with Taka. I mean, look at how shredded Taka is. I wouldn't want to be topless next to that either. Finding himself cornered, Mondo reveals he was motivated by his own secret. He accidentally got his brother killed while showboating during a motorcycle race. Chihiro asked to be his workout buddy, since they felt uncomfortable in their masculinity due to severe lack of gains. Chihiro's strength in admitting their own secret humiliated Mondo, who envied Chihiro's honesty in the face of his own immense survivor's guilt. Unable to reconcile these feelings and terrified of having his secret exposed, Mondo's jealousy turned to rage, which in turn ended in homicide. Immediately regretting his actions, Mondo
Kondo worked overtime to protect Chihiro's secret, moving their body and flipping the locker room furniture around, even at the risk of having his crime discovered. Mondo's punishment is the Cage of Death, a motorcycle stunt that Cirque du Soleil flattens him into delicious, nutritious Mondo butter. In the aftermath, Byakuya reveals he knew Mondo was the murderer the whole time, having witnessed him leaving the crime scene. He tampered with the body to see who would notice, and now considers Makoto his main competition. Another clash trial means another floor has been unlocked, so the students spend their morning exploring. There's a shiny new rec room and a physics lab with a giant air purifier, or one of those plasma globes you see at children's science museums. In the newly unlocked art room, Makoto discovers something strange. A photo of Mondo, Leon, and Chihiro that nobody remembers taking. Unfortunately, Monokuma snatches it away before the kids can make sense of it. Aqua Woman Hina also has something to share. In an earlier cutscene, we saw Hina having some scantily clad insomnia. Fun fact, by the way, if you play these games, these are the scenes your friends and loved ones will walk in on you playing. For all James knows, this entire game is upskirts of anime girls. Consider yourselves warned. Woo! Hina would rather have room service than fan service, though, so she sneaks out for a midnight snack, only to hear a strange noise coming from the bathhouse. Hina thinks she saw a g -g -g ghost but when the group goes to investigate, they instead find something less ghoulish and more GLaDOS. This is Alter Ego, an artificial intelligence big Chihiro 6 created in their image. After fixing the laptop from the library, Chihiro set Alter Ego to look through its encrypted database, hoping to uncover the secrets of Hope's Peak. They hid the laptop top in the bathhouse since it's the only room in the school without cameras. Even the mastermind has to draw the line somewhere. As it turns out, Monokuma's not the only unwanted attention to worry about. While ultimate fan art appreciator Hifumi's been simping for Celeste all game, this animated avatar is much more his speed. Taka also develops a screen addiction after Alter Ego simulates a pep talk from his ex-bro Mondo, sparking a transformation that leaves Taka Super Saiyan some weird shit. <laughs> With all this attention, it's no wonder Alter Ego goes missing a few nights later. All eyes are on Tweedleweeb and Tweedledum, but Byakuya thinks there's a traitor amongst them. A saboteur! His accusation has some legs, too, given that an earlier cutscene revealed that one of the students is indeed in cahoots with their homicidal headmaster. To make matters worse, Monokuma adds a brand new murder motive, a blood money cash prize of $10 million, which comes out to roughly two and a half squid games. Soon enough, the breakfast club once again turns up a couple heads short, sparking a panicked search. The group finds ultimate gambler Celeste in the rec room, having been assaulted by a mysterious Autobot cosplayer. She tells them everyone's favorite pervert Hifumi was also attacked, which she captured on the fanboy's camera. Outside, Toko and Byakuya join the chase, which brings them to the library. They find a bloodied Hifumi, who's nicknamed his mystery attacker Robo-Justice. While this Justice isn't wearing a robe, he did leave his gavel, Justice Hammer number 2. Celeste was attacked with the smaller Justice Hammer 1, leading the group to surmise Robo-Justice is upgrading his attacks with increasingly larger hammers. Because when normal logic fails, anime logic prevails. The students embark on a chase through the school, getting separated in the chaos. Hifumi was left in the nurse's office to recover, but the students returned to find him double-tapped on the head with Justice Hammer 3. Robo-Justice isn't done yet, since ultimate moral compass Taka is found in the physics lab, Justice Hammered by number 4. This head-denting double act is still by the book, since Monokuma established earlier that students could actually kill up to two people, just to keep things spicy. If this robo-ruckus is giving you a headache, hold on, cause it's not over yet. While everyone's running back and forth, both Taka and Hifumi's bodies go missing. They're rediscovered in the art room, where Hifumi reveals he still has life in him yet. He rambles about recovered school year memories before finally passing on, but not before naming ultimate clairvoyant Yasuhiro as the killer. Hiro really should have seen this one coming. Despite the mayhem, this seems like an open and shut case. After all, Yasuhiro's been found inside the Robo-Justice costume, and the suit is built to his exact dimensions except for his hair, which continues to baffle scientists to this day. Hiro's also the only person without an alibi for one of the murders, making him an obvious prime suspect. A few things aren't adding up, though, like why Kyoko discovered the supposed killer stuffed in a pool locker, and the fact that someone wearing the robot suit can't bend over at the waist, meaning they can't be up and slinging dead bodies all over the school. At the other crime scenes, Makoto discovers other anomalies. While it's obvious some of the hammers in the workshop were turned into the murder weapons, one of the 
cameras left behind has been scrubbed clean. Additionally, a dolly in the workshop seems to have been moved there from the physics lab, a fact confirmed by some bloody wheel marks. At the Clash trial, Makoto begins putting the pieces together. The dolly was likely used to move Taka's body, but Hifumi's was a bit too corpulent for easy transport. The solution comes in the form of his lens wipe, which Makoto found in the nurse's office. Hifumi's bloody glasses were mysteriously clean when his body was found in the workshop, meaning he must have wiped his glasses to be able to see. Makoto was paying attention to his lack of a kill graphic, but kudos if you also noticed this, and realizes Hifumi faked his attack using blood bags. Further discussion reveals it was in fact Hifumi who moved Taka's body and killed him as well, but not during the Hammer Time Havoc as everyone assumed. Taka was killed earlier, at 6am according to his broken watch. The numbered hammers were a pink herring designed to confuse the time of death and hide a duplicitous double act. So who played the final round of whack a nerd Not Hero, who was knocked out and stuffed in the Robo Justice costume. It was our goth gatekeeping, gaslighting, girl boss gambler Celeste, who tricked Hifumi into helping her before murdering him in the workshop, cleaning off the extra hammer in the aftermath. The Yasuhiro Hifumi was referring to wasn't our psychic friend Hero at all. It's actually the real last name of Celeste, who's been going by the very My family was aristocracy before the war sounding surname of Ludenberg. She's given a chance to prove Makoto wrong by displaying her name in her handbook. When she refuses, she's correctly voted as the Blackened. Before she's executed, Celeste reveals she was the one who stole Alter Ego, which is how she manipulated Ultimate Simp Hifumi to lay the hammer down on Taka. Celeste has maybe the most relatable motivation in the game. She was gonna use Monokuma's blood money to buy herself a gothic castle filled with hundreds of male servants. A hundred stud draw, if you will. It's a beautiful dream, but come on, Celeste. For 10 million, you'd be lucky to get a gothic condo in today's market. And that's before your man slaves finally unionize. Her aristocratic execution is the burning of the Versailles witch. In adherence to the old ways, the burning woman is, of course, eventually extinguished by a flying fire truck. Makoto and Ultimate uh, Kyoko find Alter Ego in the bathhouse using a key Celeste gave them. While they're alone, Kyoko reveals she's been disappearing to a secret room on the second floor. Makoto checks it out for himself and discovers a student registry and an ominous warning. But before he can explore further, he's sneak attacked by Jason Luchadorhees. Thank you. Makoto wakes up later to find the secret room gutted. As he wanders back to his dorm, he overhears a brawl in the gym. It's Monokuma, engaging in mortal combat with the aforementioned traitor, Sakura. Sakura is tired of taking orders, despite the headmaster's threats towards an unnamed hostage. Makoto can barely understand what he's seeing through the concussion camera filter, so he doesn't mention it to anyone the next day. Not even Kyoko, who's heard that Makoto is keeping secrets from her. Ma'am, your intro card in this game is just a bunch of fucking question marks. While Makoto is left wondering if he's the asshole, another floor of the school opens up. There's a data center and the headmaster's office, but both are locked. The students consider breaking them down, but Monokuma installs a game patch to forbid such a thing. Class athletes and girlfriends and my headcanon! Hina and Sakura are excited by a chem lab containing nutrient supplements, but next to all that protein powder is a shelf full of poison. I'm sure no one will touch the poison. Makoto also finds a another mystery picture of Celeste, Hifumi, and Sayaka. It's dismissed as Photoshop fraud, but Monokuma insists he's not up to funny business. The students regroup with Alter Ego, who's made some shocking discoveries. The plot to entomb the students was not born of mad god Monokuma, but the real headmaster of Hope's Peak, who's apparently still somewhere in the school. Kyoko has an emotional reaction to this news, and later grabs Makoto for a secret mission. After staging an argument as a diversion to distract Monokuma, Makoto stealthily hooks Alter Ego up to an ethernet cable in the secret room Kyoko discovered previously. While Alter Ego becomes the singularity, Monokuma has some shocking revelations of his own. The remaining students are gathered in the gym, where the headmaster cuts right to the chase and outs martial artist Sakura as his ace in the hellhole. While Hina stands by her workout buddy, their less swole peers aren't so understanding. The class warfare escalates until Hina gets caught in the crossfire, almost getting scissored by Genocide Jill. Wait. The attack makes Sakura furious, and she challenges everyone to face her directly if they've got a problem. As you can imagine, this offer from a 200-pound martial arts champion doesn't get many takers. Or so it seems, until Hina later finds Sakura lounging a little too hard in the rec room. The door is barricaded by a chair, but Makoto breaks the window and knocks it away. Unfortunately, Sakura's already dead, having seemingly been bested by an unknown assailant. A devastated Hina leaves to get the others, and soon everyone's locked 
locked onto this locked room mystery. Early investigation reveals Sakura's taken two blows to the head, and Makoto finds some broken bottles nearby. Hina reveals Sakura asked to meet with Toko, Hiro, and Byakuya to clear the air, leading the ultimate swimmer to suspect one of them is the killer. At the crime scene, Makoto finds some yellow powder on Sakura's shoe that matches a spill in the chem lab. The residue of a protein shake? Or perhaps poison! <laughs> At the Clash trial, Makoto explains the two blows by proving both Hiro and Toko had attacked Sakura when they went to meet with her. Hiro, due to an error in judgment. As soon as I heard that, I just knew. I knew she was gonna try and kill me! And Toko, due to a shift in personality from seeing the aftermath of Hiro's attempt at self-defense. I got so startled, I smacked her with the first thing I could find! Which I guess was a bottle. Neither of them are to blame for killing Sakura, though. I mean, what's a few concussions between friends, right? Judging from the blood around Sakura's mouth, her real cause of death was poisoning. The powder on her shoe came from the poison shelf in the chem lab! <laughs> Unexpectedly, Hina steps up and tearfully confesses to the murder. Murder. Kyoko isn't buying it though. She knows that Swole's sisters are for life, and Hina can't explain how she barricaded the room from the inside. Makoto eventually catches Hina in a lie. But the footprints left at the scene were not moving from section C to section A. That contradicts what you just said. He pieces together that Sakura's killer was actually Sakura herself, having barricaded the door from inside the room before drinking the poison. Hina reveals Sakura gave her a goodbye letter, blaming the ultimate martial artist's death on the class's callousness. Hina purposely threw off the investigation in order to get everyone executed. However, it turns out Monokuma actually got his paws dirty in this case, and he reveals that the note Hina read was a forgery, planted to prod her into action. Sakura's real letter explains that Monokuma is threatening her family dojo to secure her services, but she implores her friends to stand together against him. Hina, whatever it takes, survive. Survive along with everyone else. She died as she lived, an absolute champ. Her final call for solidarity unites the students against their headmaster. Not quite how Monokuma wanted this to go, but he gets things back on track with an execution. Trying to execute Sakura for her own suicide would be hard, not to mention a bit gauche, so instead he makes things work with an electric guest. It's Alter Ego, who's punished for their naughty networking with a bit of constructive overkill. Is Alter Ego sentient enough to go on the kill count? Well, I know James counted androids and the alien kill count, and they're basically AI, so yeah. Let's go ahead and put Alter Ego on the count. The surviving six students gain access to the fifth and final floor of Hope's Peak, which contains a large greenhouse and a dojo absolutely lousy with cherry blossoms. There's a bio lab slash WWE viewing room, though it's kept under lock and key, and a classroom that's been painted red by some unknown event. Byakuya theorizes this mess is what's left of the students of Hope's Peak, and is why the school shut down a year ago. In an unexpected bout of helpfulness, Toko's found a clue of her own. A knife! Allowing any of these students to have a knife on them seems foolhardy at best, so the group votes Makoto as least likely to do something stupid with this and lets him hold on to it. Their meeting is interrupted by Monokuma, who accuses one of them of stealing from him. Kyoko reveals to Makoto that she was the thief, having snuck into the headmaster's office earlier. As it turns out, Sakura got in a parting shot before downing her poison, and violated the rules by breaking the office door's lock. Looking through the school files has yielded a startling secret. When Makoto asks what it is, Kyoko leans in close and whispers the 22 words every guy wants to hear. Mukuro Ikusaba, the 16th student, lying hidden somewhere in this school. The one they call the ultimate despair. Watch out for her. Kyoko also found a key, the item that Monokuma mentioned he had stolen from him. She wants Makoto to act as a distraction so she can sneak away and figure out what it goes to. Makoto is hesitant, but he's won over by a pep talk. If you spend all your time trying to avoid danger, You'll never move forward. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I would die for you, ma'am. Makoto successfully baits Monokuma, allowing Kyoko to disappear somewhere even Big Brother Bear can't find her. Later that night, a feverish Makoto passes out yet again and has a sweaty nightmare. Maybe take your hoodie off before bed? He's awakened by another appearance of Jason Luchador Hees, who then turns into Kyoko. Makoto assumes it was all a fever dream until he discovers the knife Toko gave him has disappeared. In hindsight, having the black 
back out, King Guard the Deadly Weapon was probably not the brightest idea. The group's been busy while he was sick, dismantling a Monokuma bomb and a horrifying robo-autopsy. Apparently, the Headmaster's been absent all day, leading Byakuya to theorize the mastermind controlling the animatronic is dead. The students decide to snoop around for clues, but discover a female corpse in the greenhouse instead. She's wearing a familiar face, but when Toko tries to remove the mask, the booby-trapped body makes a big boom-boom. There's no way to determine the victim's identity, due to it being exploded and in pieces all over the greenhouse, but they do find a clue. Another key. This one unlocks the data center on the fourth floor. It's a wall-to-wall -wall cabin in the woods surveillance room, meaning this is the mastermind's hideout. A nearby TV is broadcasting their actions, and a nearby Monokuma is- wait, Monokuma? What? Yep. This killing game is still going strong, and their headmaster host reveals it's being televised all around the world. Before they can ponder how that's possible, they'll have to solve the murder of their smokin' Jane Doe to avoid execution once again. While Makoto had floated the idea that the body was Mukuro Ikusaba, the 16th student, Lying hidden. Yakuya is more inclined to believe the corpse is the missing Kyoko. To make matters worse, the group's midnight Monokuma maintenance means Makoto is the only one without an alibi for the murder. Throw in the knife that went missing from his room, and Makoto is starting to look very guilty. For being the ultimate lucky student, dude can't seem to catch a break. Honestly used to it at this point, Makoto sets to work clearing his name. He quickly deduces the cause of the explosion, which was the bomb the group removed from the Monokuma bot earlier. Their mess of a murder victim still has a hand intact with red acrylics and a tattoo of Fenrir, the Wolf of Ragnarok, and a very good boy. He's also the symbol of a Middle Eastern mercenary group that Buyakuya read about during one of his many nights in the classified closet. Just before the class trial, Kyoko proves she's not dead by showing up in the flesh. Hiro takes a little bit of extra convincing. <laughs> but if Kyoko didn't go kill Boom, who did? Makoto has an answer. So it must have been Mukuro Ikusaba. The 16th. Her student profile reveals she was the ultimate soldier, a title she earned during her time with, drumroll please, Fenrir, which explains the tattoo on the back of her hand. Makoto is able to logic himself an alibi using the greenhouse's sprinkler schedule. The sprinklers are set to go off right at 7.30 every morning, right? So if the body had been in the garden before 7.30, then it should have been completely soaked. However, Kyoko goes on the offensive. If you vote for me, and I die here, the mystery of this school will stay hidden forever. Which is why I can't let that happen. She throws Makoto under the bus and back into the suspect pool. And when Monokuma abruptly ends the trial, Makoto ends up voted as the guilty party. With a parting apology from Kyoko, I don't expect you to forgive me. Makoto is sent up for a heart and body pounding execution. However, he's saved at the last minute by a literal deus ex machina. It's Alter Ego, who has just enough juice to save Makoto from the class compactor. Guess I was a little early counting that kill, but whatever. Spared his punishment, Makoto pulls a Veruca Salt and tumbles down the school's garbage chute. Later, Kyoko jumps down to join him and finally opens up about her mysterious origins. Kyoko's memory was wiped when she came to the school, causing her to forget who she was or why she was there. Her investigation has jogged her memory, causing her to remember she's the ultimate detective, part of a long line of sleuthing royalty. She had come to Hope's Peak to confront her estranged father, who is actually the missing headmaster. He'd abandoned both her and the family business to pursue the lucrative lifestyle of a teacher. Kyoko goes on to hypothesize that the class trial was meant to get her executed, since Monokuma isn't exactly thrilled about the ultimate detective unraveling all his hard work. Always a stickler for rules, though, he can't kill her without making sure the murder follows school regulations. The victim in this case was originally supposed to be Makoto, but Kyoko fought off his masked assailant, leading them to be killed instead. Kyoko still has her ultimate hall pass device, so she busts them out of the trash compactor and into a truly unfortunate camera angle. I'm not mad, Danganronpa. <sighs> just disappointed. Rather than try and sneak around, the pair make a play and confront Monokuma directly. Kyoko accuses him of violating school regulations, but their Ursine teacher gleefully counters that the class trial was in bounds. Mukuro was indeed murdered by another student. Monokuma offers them a makeup exam in the form of a retrial with a twist. They must solve not only Mukuro's murder, but all the mysteries of Hope's Peak. Success will mean freedom, while failure will lead to a class-wide execution of the remaining six students. 
students. Makoto has a happy reunion with his friends and explains the rules of their next assignment. To aid in their investigation, Monokuma opens up access to the rest of the school. This includes the biolab, which is revealed to be a makeshift morgue. This is where Monokuma has been storing their dead classmates, but Makoto notes that only nine of the lockers appear to be occupied, which doesn't match the number of bodies that should be in there. There's also the second floor dormitories, which have seen some better days. There, Kyoko finds her father's private room. Daddy Headmaster had himself a hidey hole, the password to which is Kyoko's name, which she has complicated feelings about. Well, Kyoko, how do you feel about this human skeleton in a box? We're not just not counting this guy because he's a bastard skelly, this is the already counted Rocket Man from the opening, who's now revealed to be Kyoko's father, the headmaster of Hope's Peak. Strangely, some of the lockers on the second floor appear to belong to the trapped students, while Kyoko has found a video of all the students agreeing to permanent residence at the school. Monokuma adds to the confusion by giving Makoto a class photo, including everyone except for him. Paranoia is in the air at the class trial, which Makoto deduces is because Monokuma gave everyone a class photo they were individually absent from. But just because the pictures are being used for evil doesn't mean they're fake. Instead, Makoto thinks they've been struck with a case of group amnesia, a theory backed up by the videos and the lockers upstairs. Monokuma confirms he's been doing some brain burgling, but refuses to disclose more info until they guess his name like a damn Rumpelstiltskin. While Mukuro's medical file confirms she was the latest victim, Makoto's still sniffing some bullshit. Makoto's something of a kill counter himself and realizes the morgue's body count is one short. Ten of the lights should have been on. Any other number is incredibly suspicious. For the record, our count is 12 so far since it includes the headmaster, Mondo's brother, and alter ego. Without those, it should be 10, which is why the nine lights is sus. The answer to this conundrum was that someone was killed twice, and it's the same someone whose face is conveniently obscured in all of their class photos, Mike Wazowski style. Ultimate fashionista, Junko Enoshima. Or rather, Mukuro disguised as Junko Enoshima. Shima. If you were paying attention, you may have noticed yet another absent kill graphic. Junko and Mukuro have been swapped from the very beginning, although Makoto actually noticed the difference earlier. Come on. <laughs> That means the real Junko is still alive and is the mastermind behind this entire game, the ultimate despair. Junko reintroduces herself with a royal entrance. We have been waiting, waiting so very long for peasants like you to appear. Her Majesty has an entire roll call of voices she can't keep straight. Oh. Did you think I was being serious? She explains that Mukuro was her older twin sister. And together, we were the Despair Sisters, aka the Ultimate Despair! These nihilist annihilators have a dark agenda of despair. So hardcore. Like, they're really into it. Super, 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 super despair. Junko essentially killed her sister because she was bored. Junko reveals that the students haven't been at the school for a couple weeks like they believed, but two years. She's wiped their memories of not only their time together, but of the event known as the tragedy, which caused Hope's peak to shut down. Junko's army of Monokuma-pilled emos have remade the world in their sick, twisted image, and this whole ordeal has been pessimistic propaganda for the surviving masses. Even Byakuya's previously powerful family name means absolutely nothing in this brave new world. The students were originally sealed into the school for protection, but the headmaster's plan was hijacked by Junko and Mukuro. Makoto casts doubt on the authenticity of this apocalypse, so Junko decides to make her captives a deal. If they vote to execute her, they'll have to fend for themselves in the toxic wasteland outside. However, if they vote to execute Makoto, they'll be allowed to stay in the school, which is stocked with food, water, and the air purifier, which she claims has been giving them the only clean air on the planet. The final debate returns to where it all started our plucky, lucky Makoto versus the world. One by one, he uses heaping helpings of hope to convince his classmates to take their chances with the post-apocalypse, rather than hiding in high school hell. Junko's plan is foiled, and she's voted in as the final black end of the game. The loss fills Junko with despair. Well, that's just... Totally the best! 
Turns out, she's into that. Maybe a little too into that. Junko happily heads into a mashup of all the executions, ending with the smash-up that should have killed Makoto. With the mastermind dead, the surviving students head into the main hall to graduate. After a final exchange of friendship vows, Makoto opens the vault doors to an unknown future, and the game ends with Monokuma coming back for one last scare. Did our students play this death game better than I played the stupid comic strip minigames at the end of each trial? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Wait just one second. James? You put Alter Ego on the kill count. Well, yeah, they're an AI like the androids and Alien. Like Ash and Bishop? They went on the kill count because they're humanoid. Alter Ego is just a stupid laptop. Wow, okay, first of all, that's not nice. Second of all, no, I'd have to redo so much shit. You could have looked at this script a week ago. It was already done. I'd have to redo graphics. I'd have to shoot, I don't know, maybe hours to just redo everything. We already have a cut of the episode and uh, it's my episode and I don't really care that much. <laughs> no one will notice. It's fine, we're gonna fudge it. Sorry, sorry everyone. Well, if you're not gonna listen to reason, Why didn't you say something last week? No way! You've never even played this game! Don't talk about Alter Ego like that! Ugh, who cares? This should do it! <laughs> Babe, if you put Alter Ego on the kill count, it's what all the comments are gonna be about. Yeah, that's fair. All right. Good set. 12 people died in Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc. The victims consisted of six men, five women, and one Chihiro, who's whoever they want to be. And it does not include alter ego. Happy husband, happy kill count, I guess. That leaves us with this cafeteria pie chart. And since playtime will differ depending on how long you spend figuring stuff out, those are all the stats I have for you today. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Celeste, since it feels like cheating to pick Junko. I love the overhead imagery of the flames around her, followed by the very funny visual gag of the fire truck being what ultimately kills her. And Fireman Monokuma is just super cute. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Daya, who was unable to shine on thanks to a traffic accident. It's a fine kill, I guess, but it happened in a flashback and without as much flair as all the murders and executions. And that's it! Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc was released in 2010 and followed by two sequels, which I'll maybe somehow be allowed to do someday. Until next time, I'm Chelsea Rebecca. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks for watching the Danganronpa Kill Count. Hi. Hi. Do you like my wig? Yeah, it's a lot of work and yeah. a lot of hairspray. It's very crunchy. I think I used three cans of hairspray on it. You did. Yeah. I had never interacted with this game ever before watching the rough cut of this episode, and I was very entertained. So hopefully you are as well. Maybe I can get you to play the second and third game with me. Maybe. Oh, shout out to uh, usual writer Tim for, for writing the first draft yes. of the script. Thank you, Tim. And then our friend Jeff Zuschlag. Jeff, Jeff Zuschlag, thank you so much. He is uh, a Danganronpa expert. So a lot of the jokes in here that you, if you like Danganronpa and you're aware of the memes and the in-jokes, that's a lot of that's Jeff. Most of that's Jeff. Be good people. Thanks again to Scentbird for sponsoring this episode. Thank you, Scentbird.